How many of you uh, uh, recently received a letter in the mail, personal handwritten letter in the mail? Show of hands. Yeah, that's what I thought. Not many of us. How many of you see some, some junk mail? Anybody? <laughs> right? Nobody writes letters anymore. Nobody writes notes. We, get, we, we text, we email, you know, we, we send that, uh, the quick stuff. But uh, handwritten personal notes are kind of fun to receive, aren't they? At least I think so. Do you know that what we're studying, Ephesians, is a letter? In fact, most of the New Testament are letters the Apostle Paul and others wrote. Uh, every, every week I try to make it a discipline in my life to write a number of letters, note cards, little notes, you know, to people in my life I want to encourage, I want to challenge, I want to thank, I want to just, you know, connect with in some way. Um, and that's sort of like the way I express that. And so each week I pray about that, who am I going to write to? And this week I was, uh, had a number of people on my list, and several of them are battling cancer, really facing hard prognosis and difficult treatments. And, and I remember sitting at my desk on Monday with my pen, little note card, thinking, what do I say? What do I write? Besides the, you know, the typical praying for you, chin up there, there. Like, what do you write? And they're facing really hard things. And I prayed about that, and it, it reminded me what I want to say to them in that letter is what I want to say to you this morning. And it's what I believe God wants to say to us in a letter that was written thousands of years ago, that letter called Ephesians, where the Apostle Paul actually writes out this prayer, first of two, in just incredible prayers that he prayed for the Ephesian Christians, Christians living in the, in the city of Ephesus in the ancient world, and for us. And I, I would suggest, and I, I believe, this is the most important thing you could possibly pray. It's the most important prayer you could pray. It's also the prayer that we're going to examine here in detail uh, this morning in this season. Our series is called Built to Last. You saw that a moment ago, looking at this book of Ephesians. And if you weren't here last week, I want to encourage you to get online. You can see the sermons from last week as we launched into this series. But just by way of review briefly, uh, in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, the Apostle Paul's laying out in detail. It, it is, by the way, the longest continuous Greek sentence in all the New Testament. It's like Paul gets going about who God is and what he's done in Christ, and he just can't stop. It's just one thought after the next, the next thing modifies the next thing. He just goes on and on about all that we have in Christ Jesus in those first 14 verses. And in a little cultural context here, in case you missed that, he's writing to Christians, early Christians, the first century, living in the city of Ephesus. That's in modern-day Turkey. It's on the Aegean Sea. It was the fourth largest city in the world at the time that Paul wrote this letter. It was a rich city, kind of a port connecting the, the Mediterranean Roman world with Asia, the, the eastern world. Uh, it was a remarkable place. It was also the cultural center for the worship of Diana in, in Latin, or the Roman goddess of Diana, or in Greek, Artemis. The temple of Artemis in Ephesus was four times larger than the Parthenon. Huge, massive. It was an economic, cultural, religious center. It was also, but all that's left today is just one little pillar standing in the middle of a field of rubble. And Paul writes to these Christians living in the shadow of this Greco-Roman world, and he says, God has chosen you, he's adopted you, he's redeemed you, he's called you his own sons and daughters. And then he comes to verse, the second half of verse, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. We're going to read that together now. This is his prayer. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We could do a lot worse than just read that over and over again for the next half an hour. That prayer is so incredible. I want to challenge you, by the way, if you're not a Bible reader, or even if you are, make this your prayer this week. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Go home, Google it, print it out, put it on your desk or on your, in your car, and make that your prayer this week for yourself and everyone you know. We're going to try to unpack it here. 
Paul is praying specifically for these Ephesian Christians who he just spent all this time in this long, beautiful, run-on sentence about who God is and what God has done and what Christ wants for them and who they are in Christ. And then I find it interesting that after he tells them all this stuff, the next thing he does is pray that they would know it. Didn't he just tell them? I mean, I just explained it all to you. Now I'm going to pray that you would really, really know what I just told you. All that we have in Christ. It's like he's saying, I know I just told you. And you may think you know. But I'm going to pray that God opens your eyes so that you really know. That you really understand. The most powerful prayer you can pray is the prayer to know God. The most powerful prayer you can pray. We pray for all kinds of things, don't we? For healing, for provision, for health, for wealth, for somebody that we love to get a job, for a relationship to be restored, for somebody to get over the flu, for just the list is endless of things you might pray for. And those are all good things. God tells us to come to him with our requests. There's nothing wrong with praying those prayers. But the most important, the most powerful prayer any of us could pray pray, is, God, I want to know you. Because it's in knowing him that all else comes to us. This is essentially what Paul's prayer is all about. He says in verse 17, I pray that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I want God to reveal himself to you. There's no higher knowledge than the knowledge of God. Now our culture would tell us different. Our culture would say the highest knowledge, the ultimate knowledge is self-knowledge. Know yourself. Understand yourself. We take self-assessment tests, right? We, we're always, uh, my dad used to call it navel gazing, which I thought that meant like the Navy, but it's not what he means, you know? Like looking into yourself, like examining myself. How am I doing? How am I feeling? What's my life like? What are my strengths? What's my personality? There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the ultimate knowledge. The ultimate knowledge is not knowledge of yourself. It's knowledge of God. In fact, the Bible would suggest that you cannot even know yourself until you know God. Because he is the one that made you in his image. And you understand who you are and what your life is to be about when you understand yourself in the context of the one who made you to be in relationship with him. The highest knowledge, the greatest knowledge is the knowledge of God. J.I. Packer wrote a book, a classic book called Knowing God. It's timeless. You ought to read it if you haven't. And you know, anybody who has two initials for a first name is really smart. <laughs> J.I. is like, almost like C.S. kind of. He says in his book, what is the greatest need in the church today? The one thing we need above all else is a deeper knowledge of God. We need to know God, know him more and better. This is precisely what Paul's getting at when he prays that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened. That's a very interesting metaphor, isn't it? The word in Greek is cardia for your heart. We get cardiac and that kind of thing from it. But he's not talking about the physical organ. Your heart doesn't have eyes. Paul's not confused about human anatomy. The eyes of your heart will be enlightened. You see, when we say something about you, like when we say today in our culture, I love you with all my heart, we're talking about emotional feeling, right? Primarily, we think of the heart as the emotional center of the human life. I, I feel this way, so I refer to my heart. But in biblical language, that's not what it's talking about. Heart is not the emotional center. Heart would be better understood as the motivational center of your life. Why you do what you do. The center of who you are is your heart. Your motivation for life comes from your heart, biblically speaking. So Paul says that the eyes of your motivational center would be enlightened. That you would see yourself and the world differently in light of God who made you. And you would live differently because of it. It's really a powerful image, he says. A kind of seeing or knowing that changes who you are and how you live. So he's not just saying, I want you to have more information in your head. He's saying, I want you to see something, know something. In fact, there's two words in Greek. If you, if you like Greek, this will be fun for you. If you don't, hey, well, you know, you're going to get a little Greek lesson. Uh, the, the Greek word for knowledge we most often see in the Bible is, we, we call it gnostic or gnosis. It's gnosko is the, is the root word. It literally means to grow in the acquisition of knowledge, like to acquire knowledge. That's how it's most often used in the Bible. Paul doesn't use that word here, which is really important. He uses a different Greek word, the word eido, E-I-D-O. This means to have knowledge, like given to us, to see or perceive in fact, this is the same root for the word to see. 
So Paul's saying knowing and seeing are right next to each other. Have your eyes opened. That's why he uses that phrase, the eyes of your heart enlightened. Paul's point here is this. It's not the kind of knowledge that you gain purely by intellectual study, where God is the subject, the object, you know, the subject you're studying, you're distant from him. It's not something you gain purely by personal experience. It's not something that you achieve for yourself. It's given to you. Your eyes are opened. That's why Paul prays for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. This is very different than having more information, isn't it? How many, how many of you remember cramming for tests? Right? Just jamming that stuff in there. It's going to leak out your ear. You just hope it stays in until you, the, you, you get past the, taking the test part, right? Just stay in there long enough, you know? That's not the kind of information and knowledge he's talking about. Seeing something, having your eyes opened. In fact, in, in Mark chapter 8, verse 18, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says to them, do you have eyes but still not see? Do you have ears but still not hear? What's he talking about? Not visual sight and audible he hearing. But spiritual perception. A kind of knowledge that's given to us. I, I, if you were here at the couples event last night, I shared this story. And, and if you weren't here, well, whatever. But uh, my, let's just say my wife is glad that this is over. <laughs> but I told the story of, 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 uh, of when I first began to really see my wife differently. We were friends, my wife Erin and I, when we were in college together. We hung out with the same group of people. But, I, you know, I, I, I thought she was cute and funny and smart, but I, wasn't, I just didn't see her that way. And then one afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, I'll never forget it, she was walking up the walkway toward Traber Dorm, and the sun was behind her, and she was wearing this dress, and it, she was tan, and, and it's it like backlit, and I was just awestruck. I saw her, right? I mean, I'd seen her before with my eyes, but this time I really saw her. And I was floored. And she was carrying this bag of laundry for her brother, which made it all the more attractive. No, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> she always gets mad when I throw that part of the story in. It, 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 Paul's saying something similar here. I want to, I'm praying that you will know stuff you know. You know it, but I want you to see it. I want it to be the way you see the world and see your life. I want your eyes to be open to truly grasp who God is and what he's done for you. Not just have intellectual knowledge that you occasionally remember, but to have it be the way you see the world. How many of you have read a passage in the Bible or heard a passage in the Bible that you know for sure you've read or heard or seen before, but for some reason that you can't explain, it comes alive to you in a way it never did before? Has it ever happened to you? What is that about? Who rewrote the, rewrote the Bible? It's the same thing that's always been there that you have actually seen before, but you see it differently. Your eyes, the eyes of your heart are enlightened, and something comes alive for you. I never saw that. I get that now. This is Paul's prayer. That the eyes of our hearts will be open to truly see and to truly know. This is, this is his own life goal. He says the goal of the Christian life. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, he says, basically, I press on toward the goal. And, and, and the goal is simply this, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Forgetting what is behind, straightening toward what is ahead, this is what I want, to know Christ. Did you ever think, like, what your purpose in life is. Be a good husband, be a good wife, provide for your family, raise your children well, pass on their inheritance. What, what's the, why are you living and breathing? For one reason, Paul's prayer, to know the God who made you. And out of that knowledge, to live the way he wants you to live. That's why it's the most powerful prayer you could possibly pray for yourself or anyone else. So specifically in this prayer, Paul prays for three things, like in this, inside of, I want you to know Christ, and specifically in these three ways in his prayer. The first thing is the hope of God's call. The hope of God's call. Now, a call is always an interruption, right? It's always, you call somebody who you do not yet have their attention. If, if uh, Tim and I are talking face to face, and I, we're having a conversation, and, and the 20 minutes in, I go, Tim! He'd be like, what, what, is there a spider? What, right? Oh, I just, I just thought I'd call you. you would be like, that's weird, Pastor Jeff. I'm already talking. You have my attention. Why are you calling me when we're talking, right? You don't call somebody who ha you have their attention. But when we read in the Bible that we've been called, that means God has got our, your attention. It means you, he didn't have it before. You weren't thinking of him before, but he's called you now. 
He called. He initiated. Your faith in Christ, however feeble you might feel it is, even the fact that you want to have faith in Christ is a result of God's call. You wouldn't want that if he didn't call. You wouldn't be thinking about him at all. Even the guilt you might carry around about, I ought to be a better Christian than I am. I ought to be a better person than I am. Even that is the result of God calling you by his spirit, speaking to you about what he wants. Not that he wants you to feel guilty, but he's saying something to you that you're beginning to get. Now, when we read about hope, the hope of God's call, hope is primarily, in our culture, a future-oriented word, looking forward. I hope for this, right? I hope this works out. But in biblical language, hope also is anchored in the past. I hope for what's to come because of what Christ has done. I look back with certainty. That's why it's called an anchor in Hebrews chapter 6. I look back with certainty to what Christ has done so I can look forward with certainty for what he will do. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 15, Paul says, But when he who set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal Christ to me. In other words, the call leads to the revelation of Christ, to know Christ. Second, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, this is the famous place where Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to the Jews and it's foolishness to the Greeks. What he means is to the Jews, that doesn't make any sense that Yahweh would have a son who dies. And to the Greeks, this is silliness. Dying gods, how does that save your life? But then he says, but to those who are called by his grace... Jew or Greek, Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. Do you catch what he's saying there? The message we preach doesn't make any sense in the world, but to those who are called. That's the same thing when you read the word of God, it comes alive to you. It makes sense in a way it didn't before. The eyes of your heart are being enlightened. That goes right along with the hope of his call. Simply put, Paul is saying that we need the hope and the assurance of knowing that we are called. And I'm guessing some of you are here wondering, well, I, don't, I don't know if I am. <laughs> I don't know what this means exactly. If you want the hopeful assurance that God really loves you, don't look to what you've done. If you want the assurance in your heart that God loves you, don't look to how good or not so good you've been. There's no assurance there. If you want the assurance that God loves you, look to what he has done. We, we put the cross up, and, and Scott McLeod, by the way, built that uh, by hand for us. So glad it's up there, because I think it needs to be up there when we talk about these kinds of things, so you can see it. I don't look to my life to know that God loves me, because there's not a lot of evidence there sometimes. I screw up. You heard some of those stories last night in my marriage as a father. I have a 21-year-old, a 20-year-old, and a 17-year-old. I've got a lot of regrets about the mistakes I've made. I'm sure you carry your own shame and guilt and regret as around. There's no hope or assurance for that, the, the God's love for me in my behavior or my track record or yours. Where's the assurance? Where's the hope? In what he's done. In Christ. That's the call. That's what we look back to. That's our anchor. So Paul says, I want you to know Christ and the hope of God's calling. Not the hope of, of how good you're doing. But the hope of who he is and what he's done. The only way you can even want to know Christ is if he's calling you. So if you're here this morning and you're going, I don't even know if I am, but I want to, or I want to want to, that itself is evidence of God calling you. Let's look at verse 18 again, sort of the centerpiece verse in this text. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. The second thing, Paul says that he wants us to know inside of knowing Christ is the riches of God's inheritance. Now the Greek expression here could mean either God's inheritance in us or our inheritance in, in God. Let me explain what that means. Some places in the New Testament talk about us as if we are God's inheritance. That he, he's going to have us someday. That we are his glory and inheritance. And that's true. But if you look back to verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1, you find out that we're called and, and adopted and chosen. And then in verse 11 of chapter 1, we have obtained an inheritance kept for us. So I think Paul's not talking about us as God's inheritance, but what we have are, and will receive from him. 
He's our inheritance. Uh, and the word inheritance here is a funny one in Greek. It, it literally means portion. I think there are some words in the English language that are fun to say. I like the word bludgeon. It's, I don't, it, not, not necessarily the meaning, <laughs> but it's funny to say bludgeon, right? I like the word curmudgeon. It's another fun word to say. I also like the word portion. I don't know why. Is it just me? Is this just weird? I just like to say words. They sound interesting to me. Uh, my friend Jerry who, uh, tells a story about when he first learned the meaning of the word portion. He, w- he grew up in, in South Central L.A., and it was very, very poor. He never had money for a hot lunch. He always had either no lunch or a little bit packed. And so one day his mother scraped up, his single mom scraped up enough money to give him that he could go get a hot lunch at, at school. He was excited about that. He got in the lunch line. He didn't know how to do it. And when you're a little kid, you don't want to do it wrong, you know. So he got behind this little girl who he knew, and she was kind of a rich girl and always was in the lunch line. He said, I'll do what she does. So she got a tray, he got a tray. She got her cutlery, he got his, you know, cutlery. She got whatever, and he just followed her along. And she came up to... Um, string beans. And he heard her say, I'll have a small portion of those, please. And the lady put like two beans on her plate. And Jerry thought, hey, that's interesting. He didn't know what the word meant, but apparently you don't don't have to eat many beans if you say it. And then he came to the end of the lunch line, and they had chocolate cake for dessert. And he said, hey, if that magic word works one way, maybe it works the other way as well. So he said, I'll have a large portion of that, please. And the lunch lady cut him a big piece of chocolate cake. You know, he's, he's an adult remembering it as a kid, you know. Puts it on his plate. And he's like, oh, oh. So he loves the word portion. <clears throat> and so do I. What's Paul saying here? In Psalm 73, Psalmist is a guy named Asaph. He says, my, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Paul is saying, what's your, your portion in the ancient world was your inheritance. It's what you got from your father's wealth. And there was not a lot of upward or downward mobility in the ancient world. You kind of born into the family, and that's where you, that was the class you were in. And so your portion from your father's wealth, your inheritance, your portion, that was your lot in life. That's what you got. What is Paul saying here is our portion, is our lot in life. What are we going to receive that defines us? Friends, do you you want a big portion of God? Or do you just want a little piece? I want the biggest portion I can get. I want more of him than I have now. And that's what he wants for you. And unlike chocolate cake, you don't get sick of him. You don't run out. There's always more. He longs to give you more of himself. And you need that more than you know. You need more of him. You need to know him more, see him more clearly. Everything in your life that you think you lack, everything you're stressed out about or anxious about, everything you worry about or feel guilty about, all of that comes into focus. I'm not saying it's a magic bullet, but I'm saying what you need more than answers to those things is to know the God who made you and loves you. Know the hope of his calling. Know the riches of his inheritance, that he is your portion. It can't be taken away. Peter tells us in 1 Peter that it's kept for us, unfading, undefiled. Nothing can touch it. Your inheritance is not subject to the market. It will not go down. It's infinite. Now, you might be thinking, like, well, this kind of idea about the inheritance and this future stuff, what good does that do me now? How does thinking about the future inheritance help me now? Well, C.S. Lewis had something to say about this. He says, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most in the present life were precisely those who thought the most about the next life. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about the future that God has in store for them that they have become so ineffective in this life. I think he's exactly right. What, he, what he's saying is this, when your future's secure, when you know that nothing can touch that, you're not living with this fear, this anxiety, because what you most need and most want is a guarantee. It's a sure thing in Christ. It's the hope of his calling. It can't be taken away. And so I'm not living my life trying to get mine. I'm not scrambling through life trying to hold on to what I can. Because I have it. I have it all in him. And it frees me then to live in this life for his glory, not my own. For his kingdom, not trying to build my little kingdom. But if I don't have that, then I'm trying to earn it. That I'm I'm hoping I'm good enough. That I'm trying to prove it. That I'm trying to scratch together an inheritance of my own. 
It's what Paul says, listen, I want you to know Christ. I want you to know the hope of his calling. Don't look at your life, look at his. And I want you to know the riches of what awaits you. It's a guarantee. And last, Paul says, I want your eyes to be opened to the greatness of God's power. So, so if the hope of his calling kind of looks backward to his calling in our life and what he did at the cross, and if the riches of his inheritance looks forward to what he will give us someday, I think the greatness of his power is like looking at it right now. It's for right now. The greatness of God's power. Let's read verses 19 through 22 again of Ephesians chapter 1. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church. Only God's power can fulfill God's calling and give you God's inheritance. It's the only way it happens. And in verse 19, it says, the greatness of his power uh, that is seen in the fact that we believe. This is a very, I've not really paid attention to this before. He's saying, how do you know the greatness of God's power? It's in your ability to believe even, because you believe according to it. If you said, I believe in what I learned in school according to my professor's lectures, right? I believe according to this. This is what Paul's saying. We believe according to the greatness of his power. He goes on to say this power is on display where? In creation? Absolutely. The heavens declare the glory of God. Life itself. Those of you who are parents, first time you see your child outside the womb with a beating heart and moving hands and breathing lungs, it's a, it's a, it's a demonstration of the power of God. Life, creation, declares the power of God. But what does Paul say? The power of God is on display in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is, I think, he's saying something that's really profound here. We often will re- see in the news and hear things about natural disasters, like a, a hurricane or a tornado or a, the fires that were happening or the mudslides that are terrible in, in California, right? Those have the power of death. We fear them. Why? Because they can destroy. They can kill. And they do. Paul doesn't use that. He doesn't say, according to the greatness of his power at work in you, like the great hurricanes, right? Or the terrible floods. Those are demonstrations of power, but they have the power of death. He talks about a power that conquers death, that is greater than death, that says death is not the end. I I don't know if if you're paying attention to this. Listen, if you're a Christ follower this morning, I don't mean that you have your act perfectly together. I mean, if you have surrendered your life to Jesus, then you have the power over death in your life. You do. You might not live like it. You might not be accessing it. But if you're in Christ this morning, that means the power that conquered death is in you, Paul says. I want you to know Christ. I want you to know the hope of his calling. I want you to know the riches of what awaits you. And I want you to know the power available to you right now in your life. This is why, when I was sitting at my desk last Monday, writing notes to people that are battling cancer, thinking, what can I say that would encourage them? It's this. It's this power. (laughs) So I just wrote to them these words, right? I want you to know Christ, the hope of his calling. Whatever comes, my flesh and my heart may fail, the psalmist says, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I'm looking out at Aaron Wise, whose father passed away, we had his funeral for Big Al. He knew us that power. He knows that hope in a way that we don't yet now know on this side of eternity. In Christ, not even physical death can touch you. It doesn't have ultimate power over you. Wow, may the, friends, may the eyes of our hearts be enlightened to know him. The best thing I could pray for you or for me is that you would know Christ. Some of you are here and you, and you don't know him. You know about him, but you don't know him. Not really. Others of you are here, maybe you like, it's like you've forgotten. Like the, you've got a veil back over your eyes. You need to have it lifted. For all of us, 
the most powerful thing we could ever pray or desire for ourselves or anyone we love is to know him, the hope of his calling, the glory of the inheritance that awaits us who are in him, and the power that's available to us in our lives. That's my prayer for you and for us. Let's pray. Father God, we, I, honestly, I feel almost as if we don't have the words. I don't have the words right now. So we rely on your word. God, I ask that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would see and know just who you are. You'd wake us up to the reality of your presence in our lives. For many here who don't know you, they just know about you. God, open the eyes of their hearts to see and know the hope of the calling, that you're calling them even now because you love them. Impress on us the riches of our inheritance in you and the power available to us by your Spirit. We, we confess to you, God, that we, we, we really kind of muddle through our lives, focused on petty things, worried about everyday events. Pray that you'd lift us out of that, that we might see that we're here for so much more than that. Ultimately, we're here to know you. So help us to know you. We pray in your name. Amen. We say this every, every week. If you're new around here, we, we, every week we close, we invite you to come forward for prayer if you'd like to. 99.9% .9 of you go to brunch or whatever it is you have to do. I just, want to rem I just want to extend an invitation again. If you are here this morning and it is a prayer of your heart to know Christ, members of the prayer team are here to pray with you and to pray for you. Feel free to come forward on either side of the close of the service. Now, brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and may the eyes of your heart be enlightened to know him now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.